Welcome to our Tuesday Tea. I'm your host, Vanessa. And I'm your co-host, Sharice. Now let's have some tea. Or wine. (laughs) (laughs) So today on the podcast, we have the, in my opinion, the number one criminal defense attorney in the country, um, Jose Baez. And, you know, it's funny because you do your job, but I know with that comes so much criticism and so much judgment, you know, just having to do what you do. Um, So, you know, what did it take? I think I kind of, I've touched on this with you. I don't think I've touched too much on the podcast regarding like my situation and it being in school, dropped out of school very young. I was a young mom, teen mom at the time. So later on, winds up getting some pretty good jobs, winds up uh, working multiple jobs just to be able to be on my own, do my own thing and raise my child. Um, went to college, dropped out in my 20s just because I, I really was doing well, had a union job, had multiple jobs. So I was able to sustain a good living for my son and myself at that time. Um, but obviously, you know, fast forward years later, didn't really think about my future as much as I should have at that time. Um, I was very young. Um, So went back to school and here I am. I'm back in uh, the medical field looking into going for like a dental career. And it's come with some, some hardships, you know, I've devoted everything to, to being in school and I've never, like I've told my academic counselors, I've never wanted anything more in my life than this. Um, so, uh, I'm graduating in May with my associates in science. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Obviously, it's only halfway through my journey. I've applied for uh, dental clinicals. And the first year I applied was right before COVID hit. So um, in April was when I got my letter saying that I was accepted and had to wait because I wasn't vaccinated at the time. Everything was so new. I was scared, didn't know what was happening. I reapplied the following year and got waitlisted. And, you know, that came with a lot of like, just feeling discouraged. I'm older, I'm not in my 20s, you know, and just, you know, just everything. So your story and things that I've read, you know, obviously, you were very well known from back in the Casey Anthony case. Um, That was, I think, where I first discovered you back then. I was, I remember watching all of it, everything. And then when the Aaron Hernandez case came out, um, you know, the same thing kind of thought like he was guilty. I remember reading your book, Unnecessary Roughness. That book truly changed my thinking in so many ways. I mean, you were just incredible in that case. Like the things that you uncovered, the ways like you did so much. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I had reached out to you regarding that and Um, it was just, it it was incredible. And I think that's when I started to get to know your story a little bit more about how you, you know, kind of like a little bit down a path where you had to really work hard for, to get to where you are. It was truly inspirational, truly just, um, remarkable. And yeah, so I kind of want to hear about how, what keeps you like, what, how did, you know, getting there, that motivation that you kept and being able to, um, you know, get to where you are today and who you are. And I mean, it's, it's amazing. Well, I think um, the first thing I can share about my journey is that I never allowed myself to envision the life that I ended up living. And I, I don't think, you know, I think that You hear these stories, these inspirational stories about, oh, I always knew this is what I wanted. And since I was a child, I wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or I wanted to be in music or or an athlete or whatever it is that that, that, um, their dreams are. But that that wasn't the case for me. Um, I I would love to have that story. I think it's an amazing story. And, 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 And I don't know. But but if I'm going to be honest, I I have to uh, be honest, and hopefully it'll it'll inspire people that it's okay not to know where your destination is, so long as that you want to go on a journey, Mm -hmm. and that you want to make your life better, and that you really want to see bigger things and better things for you and your family and everyone around you that you love. So that was my case. I, I grew up raised by a single mother. 
who didn't have an education. Uh, she had, quite frankly, a third grade education. Uh, she could barely read and write and worked around the clock to support myself and my three older sisters. So education was never, ever, ever, ever a, a thing that was pushed in my household. Um, and if I, I should, if I can be so bold to, to, to say this, um, if you left my house, it's because you got pregnant. Or got, or in my case, got somebody pregnant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, and uh, I feel like uh, growing up, yeah, that was very common. Yeah. It's a very common tale, even in 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 my, you know, the Hispanic culture. Yeah, I was yeah. just gonna say I'm Puerto Rican too. So in the Puerto Rican house, yeah, in the families, yeah. unfortunately it was, you know. And and it's interesting because um that's it's almost as if there is no excuse or no other reason or i guess maybe it's guilt that that keeps uh, us in, in a situation that at home that might not be well one or you know i guess you reach a certain age and you know everything right <laughs> so that i was no different think, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. so in the ninth grade i knew everything and and i dropped out of high school um, it wasn't within a year or two that that um, I I ended up getting uh, my daughter's mother pregnant, and I was I turned around, I looked in the mirror, and I was 17 years old. So, well, what do I do? <laughs> um, I, I, at that point, I realized, okay, um, I, I never knowing who my father was. Um, I mean, you know, I, I had vague memories of him when I was a child, more around four or, four or five years old, but I really had no idea of who he was, um, where he was at, and if I was ever going to see him again. And it never sat well with me. So I, I wanted to make sure I didn't do that to another person, and, and especially my my child. So I... I Joined the Navy when I was 17. And it was interesting because it was something that I absolutely hated and detested every single day I spent in the military because I had such a significant problem with authority. <laughs> <laughs> and, How uh, long did that last? Uh, well, I did, I did uh, a regular tour, which was three years okay. plus six in the reserve. Um, oh wow! Okay. Oh, so you did it, yeah. 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 So, and you know, it it was more of an experience of I knew what I didn't want to be, and I saw lifers in the military, and I saw how adults for the first time really I, I saw adults outside of my family unit how they were living and how they were supporting their families, and I just I don't know I just I, I had this incredible motivation to do something but education still wasn't in the picture mm -hmm. so it wasn't until you know we have these these jobs where we start to get the things we like in life and we think well that's that's the key to growing mm -hmm. right? you're gonna get a car you get an apartment it's yours you have nice furniture these are your goals mm -hmm. and, and, and these are um, really not goals at all. They're illusions of, of and really all they are is sustainability. You, you know, you say, yeah. how much can I sustain to be as comfortable as I want to be for the present time? Mm -hmm. And um, and that changes too throughout the years, you know? It like, does, because it's never going to be enough. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. And then I, I met someone who was a friend of mine at, at work who was going to school and he was in a criminal justice program at the local community college. And, and he basically, you know, one day we have a conversation in the office and, and, and I don't know, it just seemed like such a, a, a amazing thing to do at the time. And I'm one of those types of people that, that, that and, I, and I guess I'm not alone in this because I see it in my son and I see it in um, in other people. 
when you find something that interests you, it really brings out a lot of passion in you. Yes. And 100%. Desire. And, and it was the funniest thing. I couldn't stop. I, I was so into uh, the classes I was going to take. And I started reading all the brochures and what I could do with a career. And it's so funny. I, I, I envisioned a career in law enforcement. That was my huh. first goal. And um, I, I, at that time, I, I started community college. And then with the GI Bill from the Navy, I got my GED. And I started to go to school. And, you know, it wasn't always easy working and going to school full time. Mm -hmm. It was a process. But, and I hear this a lot, you know, with older people who don't know whether they want to go back to school. They're like, well, it's going to take like four years or seven years or however, that's too much time. And my response is, you're going to pass through those four years, seven years. Yeah, yeah. So you could be four years or seven years with an education, or you could be exactly. four years, seven years down the road without one. Exactly. Which yep. you choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, I went, up, I, I did all of that. And um, what was interesting to me that really kicked my desire for education into into um, overdrive, I should say, was when I went away, after I got my associate's degree, I went away to a college town for my four-year degree. And I went to FSU, which is uh, Florida State University <laughs> in Tallahassee, which, it's a very small town, right? I, so, so you know a little bit about my background. I was born in the Bronx. Well, New York, right? Okay. I That's... lived in the Bronx until I was uh, in, you know, mostly through uh, elementary school. And then we moved to Miami. And then from there, I grew up in Florida and, and, and Little Havana, which is a predominantly Cuban neighborhood at the time. Now it's just a tourist attraction. <laughs> um so you know when I went away to Florida State, I, something magical really happened to me. And I lived in a town where everyone was young, everyone was, you know, my age and had the same interests of pursuing an education, different educations, different topics and stuff like that. But we had that commonality amongst the entire community. And then, you know, you, you start developing some school spirit, you start meeting people and you start, and the university was so inclusive and so, um, you know, it gave me so many opportunities for different interests, whatever you wanted to pursue, whether it was uh, within your career or extracurricular, it was there. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely fell in love with it and, and fell in love with the experience. Um, looking back now, I wish it were there longer, but when I was living it, I was trying to get out of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always like so that. We have this thing where we want to finish school right now, right now, right yeah. now. And the reality is I wish I had enjoyed it more because never again. And I just recently was there a couple of weeks ago uh, for a football game. And I have to tell you, I just, it, the, the memory started, mm -hmm. started yes, sinking in. The energy and everything, right? Yeah, I know. I, I, I absolutely loved it. And yeah. so what happened, uh, I'll, I'll speed up the story a little bit. That's okay. Oh, no. Don't worry. Uh, enjoying it. <laughs> my last semester, uh, I had applications with federal law enforcement agencies. And my last semester there, I was, I had my, I had met someone who was my college sweetheart. And she was going to law school. And she just basically turned to me one day and said, Jose, hey, why don't you come with me to law school? And my, and I remember this like it was yesterday. It was, it was, my response to her was, I'm not smart enough to be a lawyer. And there's no way I'll get into law school. I just, I can't do it. There's no way I can do it. Um, and she looked at me like I was ridiculous. And, and, and the fact that her belief in me um, 
really turn me around and made me think, okay, well, maybe I can do this. Maybe you do have what it takes. Yeah. It's crazy how someone, yeah, when so just one person, one person to believe in. And that's all it takes is one person to genuinely believe in you yeah. and, and and maybe shake you up a little bit to, to make you realize that it, it, beautifully in this world, in this country, that you can do and be anything you want to be. Mm-hmm. And having said that, um, it's kind of funny because when I took the entrance exam for law school, I did terrible. <laughs> so, so, oh, really? Oh, all so I did was reinforce my original <laughs> belief, which was I couldn't do this. And that didn't and deter you from trying. It, yeah, how did you? I, yeah, how did you handle it? Well, I, it's funny. I, 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 I always screw this up. I, I, I scored in the ninety seventh percentile, which means that 97% of the people who took the test did better than me. Oh, okay, no. That's how bad I did. I'm sure I got my name right, though. That's, that's the one thing I'm sure. So. Um, and, I, but you know what? It was so funny. It was blind faith and blind ambition that just kept me going forward that I wasn't even hearing it from the institutions. I still kept applying. And I applied to 25 different law schools. Oh, and I, it's so funny. We had a whiteboard in the back, and her and I both applied to all these schools. And each week, I would get three or four letters in the mail. Thank you for applying. Unfortunately, thanks, but no thanks. Mm-hmm. Um, and rejection letter after rejection after rejection letter. And it got to the point where I was going to go to a non-accredited law school because I was still determined. I, I, I'm like, no, I'm going to do this. So you always kept that faith, and okay. It was, it was, it was a burning fire inside of me and it wasn't going out mm-hmm. anywhere. Mm-hmm. And then um, it was the craziest thing. The, the last school I hadn't heard from was a school in Miami, which is where I was from, uh, that I had looked at the end and realized I hadn't gotten the rejection letter yet. And so I had literally <laughs> called them up and said, I'm sorry, I think you guys forgot to send me my rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is what we'll fax it to you back in the days <laughs> when we had fax machines. <laughs> to my surprise, they accepted me, and it was a great shock that 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 they accepted me. And I and it was so crazy because I was so um, determined, mm-hmm. stupid blind and ambitious <laughs> at the same that i even applied to the best schools i applied to harvard uh but you never know i know i think that's to, great i figured look there's a couple things that can happen uh, exactly one, one uh you know maybe someone over there will put my my file on the wrong stack <laughs> you know two maybe somebody over there will have a sense of you. <laughs> and and and, and three they'll reject me Oh, well, no. <laughs> they, nobody over there had a sense of humor. <laughs> um, I got denied to Harvard, but I, the interesting fact is now I think um, 13 or 14 of the, of the schools that I applied to out of the 25 have asked me to come teach there. Really? Isn't that crazy? And they were all rejections. So, uh, including Harvard, for which I, I go every year and teach a, a class on trial advocacy. So, you know, it, it, it's it's amazing how life can be, mm-hmm. uh, how life can throw you a little bit of luck, but it's not really luck because if you don't pursue it, you'll never get it. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And, and, you know, there were there was every reason in the world, even looking back today, for me to say, "Look, um, you're a you're a freaking idiot. What are you doing applying to Harvard Law School when you got one of the lowest scores in the entrance exam in the country?" So, uh, but and my grades in college weren't great either. I was just marking time until I could get my degree and move on. Okay. So, uh, so that that was something that. It was really a surprising experience that I would credit people who were around me who believed in me. Mm -hmm. But you had to have Uh, some belief in yourself as well, right? To apply to all these great schools. So that was, that was good. Yeah. And then, you know, your belief in yourself, of course, and just doing it. 
really pursuing it and not letting anything or anyone, and this is literally the hard part, mm -hmm. uh, uh, tell you no. And our dreams are, yeah, they're for our, our, our dreams are our dreams. So we're the ones that have to believe in them first, you know, really, and see that vision, that bigger picture that we have for ourselves before anyone else can even, you know, see that, I think. 100%. And you have to guard them. Um, but, you know, you have to have patience with them. And I, and yes. I tell oh, them. that's the hardest part for me because <laughs> Lord knows patience. I do not have patience. Well, that's, that's the Sorry. biggest failure I'm learning. Of, of, of everyone because when you have, everyone has dreams, mm -hmm. you're not going to be, you're not going to be that you're not inventing anything new there. Mm -hmm. And everyone um, wants to work hard. And so a lot of people do work hard for their dreams, mm -hmm. but, but the, the rarest thing that most people fail on is the patience to see them through. Yeah. Because if you don't have patience in your own dreams, you know, how can anyone else have patience for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, for sure. So you've always had that motivation and everything that you really needed to get to where you just, you never gave up. You just kept pushing through and. Yes and no, Vanessa, <laughs> because you heard, if you heard my story, I didn't always believe in myself. Right? No, you didn't. Yeah. But once you got that little bit of belief in yourself, you kept fighting for yeah. what you felt you could I, I can achieve. I think, I, I think sometimes, like they say, it takes a village, right? Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're not alone on an island in this world. And um, it's important to have good people around you who have your best interests at heart. And if you don't have that, then um, you're giving yourself a significant handicap. Mm -hmm. um, and you try, I, I really try in my life to to be a good person in someone's life if they're in my life i want to try and affect them in a positive way mm -hmm. if not then then i, I shouldn't be around yeah you know, I I don't don't. Like be a positive influence on someone um i, I should go mm -hmm. so that's kind of what i try to do even if it's a it, even if it's a minimal relationship mm -hmm. um, whether it's a small friendship that's many people would call an acquaintance I'll try and be positive with my friends or or or, or folks that I meet. Um, yeah, you definitely do. I've that. seen. Yeah. I've even seen like interviews, interviews that you've yes. done, and even she was saying like you just always handle yourself with such class, grace, yeah. and class. Yeah, very. Oh, um, that's truly yeah, it's very truly admirable. But you don't um like you were saying. I think yesterday you were saying like he doesn't let his feathers get ruffled. Yes, like you like very are able to try to push your buttons, and you don't let them let you get there yeah like you stay calm and you're able to just um not put them in their place but basically let them know where you stand and they're not going to let you um push you around or or make you um change your character yeah I, I, well you know there are a lot of fake people in this world and people who want to judge other people and, and and think that they're um either morally superior to you or or to anyone else for that matter um and the, the real the reality of it is is we all need to check ourselves we all put our pants on one leg at a time mm -hmm. you know? so, everyone's everyone's going through something everyone's yeah. dealing with life and just trying to navigate through through this thing That's called life yeah how do you handle all of the the hate yes. or the backlash that comes with what you do um, you know, I mean, I know that's, that's and tough. It's a lot, especially nowadays with social media and mm. everyone's able oh. to type what they say, say what they want to say and try to like, just hurt people for no reason at all. Well, you know, it's not easy if you allow it to take on a greater importance than what it really is. Um, I, again, I, I look at, I look at situations where you have people on social media who who get computer courage, as I like to call it, you know? <laughs> so, uh, they, they'll write things they would never say to you to your face. Mm -hmm. And even those people who say something to your face, it comes from a place of um, something unsettled within themselves, that they feel they need to impose uh, either hatred or, or dislike on someone else. And... Look, it's like you said, everybody's going through something. So, you know, 
if I'm not hurting you and I'm not involved in your life in, in, in a way, in a certain way, just get out of my way. I really don't have any time for you. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our, our time here is, is minimal at best. Yeah, exactly. Life, life flies by uh, uh, unbelievably fast. And given that, I, you know, I try my best. At, look, there, there have been some things said about me that, that have been very hurtful and very painful. Uh, but the reality is, is, is the people who know me know who I am. And, and they're all that they, you know, they're the only people that matter. Yeah, not exactly. The people that matter to you, as long as they know who you are as a person, that's what true. That's what truly at the end of the day is, is important. I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, ones that matter. To me, my most important position in life is, is, is being a father. And yeah, yes. if, mother, if mother. my, if my children know who I am and know what I'm about, I, I really think that your legacy, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, you know, look, you know, while while partners are great and and they're a necessity in life, um, sometimes their love is not unconditional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not like a children or, or, or a dog. Or it's unconditional for a time, a short time, yeah. right? But you know, if you do your job right as a parent, that that's going to be unconditional love that yeah. will last. I always say that children and dogs, yes. dogs are like just <laughs> so loyal. They give you that unconditional love. They truly do. No, so cats so, are out of the question, right? Is that, oh, yeah. I have a cat. Oh no, I don't <laughs> mind cats. I'm just, uh, my allergies are out of control. So I have to stick with like hypoallergenic dogs. So that's, so and they don't show the link to the podcast when you two debate cats and dogs. <laughs> no, 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 no. I used to I used years to have ago. I used to have two dogs and a, and cat, a cat, so I had like yeah. a whole zoo going on. Um, yeah, I, I just I love pets. So yeah, if I could does. have like a farm, I would. But my allergies say otherwise. So gotcha. you're an attorney and also an author, so you've written a few books. Mm -hmm. um, I read two of them, probably like two of the popular ones that I know of that I've heard of uh, was the Casey Anthony and the Unnecessary Roughness about uh, Aaron Hernandez. And um, the Aaron Hernandez was, that was the first one I read and it was so good and completely changed like my whole outlook on everything that I winded up even reading the Casey Anthony book. And I was like, okay, let's see how, how this one was. Um, but that one didn't change my mind too much. So <laughs> that one was, you know, still yeah. kind of like on the fence. Um, I think what, like what you're talking about, like the negativity. Yeah. Or the, like, well, um, like, did you get more with the Casey Anthony case or did, did like other people that read the unnecessary roughness, did they feel that same thing that I felt where it was like completely just, I mean, it, it's crazy how much went unnoticed and you had to go and li dig through and research on your own and actually find out like, I couldn't even believe that was all allowed. And I mean, I don't know much about the whole legal system or anything of that sort, but um, it was, it was really astonishing to like look into and read about for me. Well, I can tell you this, um, Aaron Hernandez's case, while it was incredibly challenging and it was a, it was a difficult and complex case because it had a lot of unique issues that came up, it paled in comparison to what I went through with, with Casey Anthony. That was rough. And that was like one of your first big cases, right? right. So, so, that, so wow. I was a newer lawyer at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, with that case. So each day was a learning experience. Each day was a new challenge. And, and as a result of that, what was important for me was to keep reminding myself, just practice law, just practice law, just practice law. And there were so many outside distractions to the point where, I mean, really, it, you you can't compare. I would say if I was comparing the two cases, um, Aaron's case was a high school baseball game where where uh, Casey Anthony's was World Series. Yeah, is that yeah. that big difference? Um, so you know, at the end of the day, I knew one. I had a case, regardless of what anyone else told me, and it was again. I guess it's that same thing that I had in applying to law school. Like I don't care what these people are all saying. This is what I believe, and this is what I know. And I also knew in my own ability. I, I trusted and believed in my own abilities, and I knew I could try the case and, and do a good job. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. I, I, um, 
in my weakest moments, in my weakest moments, when the entire world was telling me I was in over my head and I couldn't do it, I knew I, I didn't. I didn't really look at it in saying, okay, I'm going to win this. I'm going to win this. I'm going to win mm-hmm. this. No, it was more like, just do a good job. Mm-hmm. If you do a good job, people will recognize that and, and, and win it. But the reality is, and I'm going to confess something to you. It doesn't matter in this business if you do a good job. It only matters if you win or lose. And, really? and that's, that's an unfortunate that is, yeah. profession. Yeah because um, people wouldn't seek me out if that were the case. And, and looking back, it, it would have been a career destroyer uh, had I have lost it. Because yes. I was, that was my next yeah. question. Yeah, how do you, what do you, you know, think? Everybody about? would have known, oh, he lost this case or that, you know? But, I, but then again, I look at other high-profile lawyers who have had big cases of loss and yeah. still moved yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, there's one or two out there that I... I, I <laughs> Yeah, I think wow. you've always had it in you. So you were destined for greatness, you know, in, in one way, shape or form. And obviously that was what was laid out before you. So, you know, it was in your destiny to succeed. So, I mean, you know, that was really it, you know, just just focus on this, the simpler things, which is practicing law. And, uh, and I knew if I could do that, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, when they say so, just breathe, you know, mm-hmm. the turn <laughs> it's hard <laughs> tell myself that all day. <laughs> Yeah, you, you got to do that. So, yeah. um, and that was as a, as a lawyer, that was my constant reminder. Just mm. this law. Do you still get hate for that case, or no? You know, it's kind of like I, I, yeah, I'm sure I do, but I mean, those are people just don't give it any energy. Folks that one didn't see the case. You know, I, I mean, I was being interviewed yesterday by um, Megan Kelly. Okay. okay, yes, I saw that. And, and my, my, how the mighty have fallen. Okay, <laughs> Megyn Kelly was once um, uh, the uh, the queen of Fox News. Now she's doing her own podcast. And, and you know, not to say that there's any anything wrong with a podcast. Hey, but, hey <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so look, when you start I, up I here, wish, though, and I, then I, here, I, I we're wish going I up could here. do that. <laughs> I wish I could do that. What I'm what I'm referring to is the budget. I mean, she she was. Uh, moderating the presidential debate at one time. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, and she sat there and we were bickering back and forth and she said to me, I saw the case and this and that. Yep. And, and I didn't think about it at the time. You but, handled you know, yourself I, that's the part that I so saw well. I, was like, I mean, just so just gracefully. Calm, just, you didn't let Well, the reality it. is when I look back is that's a big lie. She didn't watch the trial eight, ten hours a day. She was. She had her own TV show at the time and was covering the news for the mm-hmm. entire world. What the hell are you doing watching eight or ten hours a day of trial for for two months? Yeah. Impossible. But why no lie way. to a lawyer? You know? <laughs> and I didn't even think of it at the time. Otherwise, I would have thrown that in her face. But the reality is, <laughs> here's someone with a platform. Okay, and this platform, she's out there boasting that she saw the trial she saw the evidence and she knows this and she knows that when she when in reality she doesn't know jack mm-hmm. and so having said, said that everyone else who got who, who believes they know what happened in that trial usually watch two minutes of news each night maybe they they, they skipped out on a little work for an hour or two and watched the live stream mm-hmm. Um, and things like that. And then there are those people who did watch it almost every day, but weren't inside the courtroom. Mm-hmm. So and there's still so much you're missing. Yeah. And I can tell you, you're not mm-hmm. inside the courtroom. You ain't, you, you ain't seeing what's That's really cool story. So mm-hmm. having said all of that, I, 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 I remind myself that these folks who have these opinions, one, their opinions and, and two, um, you know, it, it's coming from a place that's less known than me. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's it's hard when you are the person that has the most knowledge and everybody's boasting like they have more of it. But in reality, it, it's just a bunch of baloney. And, mm-hmm. and to sit there and, and debate it with with uh, trying to argue with a with with a fool, fool. it's mm-hmm. like administering medicine to the dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gets you nowhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So having said that, you know, that's, that's the way I look at it. I have to remind myself, it's not easy. Um, 
And it, and it's really funny about Casey Anthony. Everybody's quick to, um, <laughs> everybody's really quick to knock her defense and her stories and her lies. Um, but they can't offer an alternative as to, okay, so what really happened then? Mm-hmm. Just to tell us, you know, she can, oh, I know she killed her daughter, but okay, but how did she do it? Where, when, why? Exactly. All of these things, uh, mm-hmm. no one can ever answer because they're too busy knocking. Coming up, yeah. yeah, just saying, you know? going against the end, yeah. Now, how so, do you feel about I tell her? You, when you read my book, um, you'll know, and and it's very different than Aaron's book because in Aaron's case, I provide yes. you with where he was and exactly what happened because yeah. there, was more, yeah, a there was more knowledge of that yeah in in the book i wish that was more put out there for people to know because exactly. there was so much information in that book that i feel like if i didn't read that book like i would have i would have never known so that was that was really a great a great book yeah I, and and you know it's just the you only it's it's a shame that we get our our information from a um from the media that that really has its own agenda and People need to see that and recognize that gone are the days of true journalism. It's it's mm. a uh, profession. How do you feel about Casey Anthony's new documentary that's out? Well, you know, after how long have we been trying to pull this off? A, a mo- uh, six months, something like yeah. that. <laughs> that if, if you think I got the time to... to <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll confess, one of my... Um, one of the things that I do least are watch true crime documentaries because I always see so much of it as unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Because I love those. Too. <laughs> I live off so that's them. good to know. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I see through it because when you live it, you know what's fake, mm-hmm. what's real, and stuff like that. And it, it just gets, it, it gets frustrating to watch. So for me, I, I really don't have the three hours or whatever it is to, to sit down and watch through that. But I'm I'm still trying to find out what's going to happen with Beth and Yellowstone. So (laughs) that's a little more valuable. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Um, As far as the uh, Aaron Hernandez, every time that comes on, every time I, any time I get to be able to watch it, I need to read the book because like she said, there's so much stuff that's in the book that isn't um portrayed on mm-hmm. any of the, the the tv shows or anything that's covered um his story my biggest thing was the the cte the you know the problem that he had with his brain do you think that's something that could have been this could have been avoided or could have um been something could have been done about it because they're trying to i hear that you can't really see signs of cte unless they're they're dead. Correct. I'll close with this because unfortunately mm-hmm. I have. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's good. good. Thank you. But I, I will tell you this. Number one, as it relates to the CTE, I never, in my representation of his case, I never said it was a mitigating factor as mm-hmm. to why he committed these murders. In fact, to the contrary, I've always felt that his defense was an innocence defense, not one of mitigation, which means basically he did it, but this is why. Yeah, he never used that because he knew he didn't do it, mm-hmm. so he didn't even have to use that, That's although he did right. have that. But it was an interesting side story to the it entire was, story. Yes. And I, and I want to close with this. Um, a CTE is a real thing, and I'm a big uh, college football fan, so I'm somewhat of a hypocrite. Where I I know that you know these players are damaging their brains, but they're adults, and now the science is far enough down the road that if an adult wants to uh, risk their future and risk their lives, they're free to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't believe children should be playing yeah. tackle football. I agree. I'm glad you said that. I would never encourage it or believe it, especially given what I know about the science. I think 18 years old is when someone should start to decide to play tackle football. They play flag football all day long for all I care. Mm-hmm. The reality is, is this. I, I compare it. I, 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 has, I wrote this in my book, and I believe this to this day, that if you allow your child to play tackle football, 
in Pee Wee or, or Pop Warner or anything before the age of 18, you are literally committing child abuse. Mm -hmm. And I say that because child abuse under the law is defined this way. And that is to do something that will intentionally harm that individual, whether it's it causes permanent injury or temporary injury, it's still creating an injury. This disease causes permanent injury. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't kill you immediately. It's repetitious. So since we're on, on camera, I'll, I'll describe it for you visually. This, say, for example, my, my fist is the brain, your brain, and it basically floats in a liquid-like substance, and your skull is wrapped around it. Now, the helmet, all they do is protect you from a skull fracture. It doesn't protect your brain. And it floats in there. So when you stop and start really quickly or you tackle, your brain goes like that up against the skull. Yes. Now, do that once. It'll get a little red. It'll heal. It'll do that. But keep doing it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And again at like an offensive lineman or somebody tackling another individual or, or something along the line. It's going to get bruised to the point where it can't repair itself. And you have permanent brain damage in an area that you are still developing. Mm -hmm. So it could create all types of problems. I, I, I give it the equivalence of giving your child a cigarette. You have a four-year-old child, would you give them a cigarette? Mm -hmm. No, that would be stupid. Mm -hmm. a cigarette won't kill them. And you can give them a pack a day, probably won't kill them for a while. But at some point, um, it's yeah. going to kill them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, five, ten years down the road, the, these young lungs are underdeveloped or, or they're damaged right. and, and, and could essentially kill them just the same as playing tackle football. And, and I think it's a atrocious reality that we refuse to face. Yeah. And, and I certainly hope that more parents... Yeah, more awareness is brought to that. that. Exactly. And, and, Forget the drama or, 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 or the, the, the pageantry of football and, and, and how much we glorify it, as much as we love it. it. It's just not a game for children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, thank I, you so much, Jose. I know you're busy. I know your time is limited. And <laughs> I like, wish I had more time. And that's I, okay. I try to do this again, maybe later on down the road if we can schedule it. But Definitely. thank you so much for having me. And, and I'll see you guys soon. Thank, thank you. you so much. You have a great day. Bye. We'll talk soon. If you would okay. like to watch this episode, check us out on YouTube at Tuesday Tea with V.